Hello, it's Dr. A, and in this video, I want to spend a few moments providing you with an overview of dermatomes and myotomes. Now, one of the first things that will be helpful for us is to provide a very brief review of the nervous system. We, of course, have the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord. And then we have the peripheral nervous system, which essentially includes everything else. Now, when we say everything else, we're referencing the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. And one of the things I'd like to bring to your attention is the fact that the spinal cord serves as the in-between for the central and peripheral nervous system. In other words, the spinal cord links directly to the central nervous system, and from the spinal cord, its extensions are the spinal nerves, which are part of the peripheral nervous system. Now, as we take a look at the image on your screen, we get an opportunity to examine the spinal column in addition to the spinal cord. And in reviewing the spinal column, we'll note that we have a total of seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum, which includes five fused vertebrae, and four fused coccyx vertebrae. But when we consider the number of nerves that extend from the spinal cord, we come up with a different number. We have a total of eight cervical nerves, 12 thoracic nerves, five lumbar nerves, five sacral nerves, and one coccygeal nerve. So if you're keeping count, here's what we have so far. A total of 33 vertebrae and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. You'll also notice what seems to be a discrepancy between the number of vertebrae and nerves for the cervical region and for the coccygeal region. So here's why. The first cervical nerve exits the spinal column above the first cervical vertebrae, and the eighth cervical nerve exits the spinal column below the seventh cervical vertebrae, and each remaining nerve exits below its corresponding vertebrae. Now, if you'll notice the area that's being highlighted and magnified, what we'll see offhand is the posterior median sulcus of the spinal cord. So just for added context, a sulcus is defined as a depression. And what we see extending from the depression are what we call dorsal roots, specifically of C2, C3, and C4. And a dorsal root is the location in which information from the peripheral nervous system is transmitted or transferred to the central nervous system. We'll find these dorsal roots in between the vertebrae, which we also call the intervertebral foramen. The other structures that we see here are the transverse processes and another dorsal root, which belongs to the C5 nerve. Each of the spinal nerves that extend from the spinal cord are responsible for providing sensation to an area or portion of the body. When we speak specifically about a nerve innervating an area of skin, we utilize the term dermatome. And the image you see here on the screen allows us to follow the pathway of those spinal nerves in the areas of skin they innervate. And specifically, what we're looking at is a group or a complex of nerves that we refer to as the brachial plexus. And this includes spinal nerves C5 through T1. Now, visualizing these areas is good, but having a written description of an anatomical location can be helpful, considering the fact that specific dermatome locations can differ from one person to the next. So to make things easier across a variety of individuals, we have what are called key sensory points. So for C5, it's identifiable on the lateral aspect of the elbow. For C6, the back of the thumb. For C7, the back of the middle finger. For C8, the back of the pinky finger. And for T1, the medial aspect of the elbow. Now, on this image, we're looking at the dermatome distribution for spinal nerves T1 through T12. And here, we can easily see how these dermatomes innervate the thoracic and abdominal cavity. But one of the things we can also note are two landmark areas, specifically how the T4 spinal nerve crosses just over the pectoral region, 
and how the T10 spinal nerve crosses directly over the umbilicus. So let's now take a look at the dermatome distribution for the lower extremity. Much like we noted for the upper extremity, it's helpful to have a written description of these areas. So we'll do the same here by making note of the key sensory points. For the L1 spinal nerve, it is the inguinal area. For the L2 spinal nerve, the medial aspect of the thigh. For the L3 nerve, the medial aspect of the knee. For L4, the medial malleolus. For L5, the top of the foot, specifically the third metatarsal. For S1, the lateral aspect of the calcaneus. And for S2, the popliteal fossa. Now, each spinal nerve root has the responsibility of providing not only innervation to the skin, which again we call dermatomes, but it also has the responsibility of providing innervation to our muscles as well, which we call myotomes. And from a clinical standpoint, we can determine whether or not these nerves are functioning properly by asking someone to perform various movements, in addition to us providing resistance against these movements. To assess the myotomes for the C1 and C2 nerve level, we ask an individual to perform cervical flexion. For C3, we ask them to perform cervical lateral flexion. For C4, scapular elevation, which we commonly call a shoulder shrug. For C5, shoulder abduction. For C6, elbow flexion and wrist extension. For C7, elbow extension and wrist flexion. For C8, finger flexion and thumb extension and for T1, finger abduction. For the lower extremity, starting with L1 and L2, we ask an individual to perform hip flexion. For L3, we ask them to perform knee extension. For L4, dorsiflexion. And for L5, grape toe extension. For S1, plantar flexion. And for S2, knee flexion. Again, keep in mind that we would also provide resistance to these movements within an assessment. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful and I look forward to catching up with you in the next one.